And I'm really excited because uh, an old friend's here this morning that used to go to this church when we was little bitty boys. And uh, his wife is here with him this morning. But when we were little kids and Fletcher Copeland was the pastor and all there was to this church was just a basement. We had church in the basement. And, and uh, he was just a little bitty boy. He was a little boy than I was because I'm two years older than he is. And I'm not going to tell you how old he is. I'm 56 and I'm not going to tell you how old he is. <laughs> But anyway, we used to have uh, such good times together. And I remember after church, I used to go home with him and have dinner. And he was very enterprising, had a store in his house, made a lot of money. I didn't like that part of it. I was a little bit jealous. But we're really glad that he's here and his wife's here. And we're glad for all the visitors. I'm excited when we have visitors. But I'm also excited because we have been several weeks now in the book of Galatians. I'm so excited because I really believe we're going to finish up verse 1 today. And I'm really excited about that. And I hope you get a blessing from it. I'm excited because our church has a, such a love for the Word of God. Uh, we have members in the church that can't seem to get enough of it, and they even have a Bible study in their home on Thursday nights. And we go out there, and everybody that wants to gathers there in their home, and we're thankful that they open their home to us. And we have a Bible study even in the home. And it's always encouraging to a pastor when the members of the church love the Word of God and want to feed on the Word of God. And so that's exciting to me. I love to teach if someone loves to hear. <laughs> and when you have people that want to hear the Word of God, well, then I just really get all excited. Like the man said one time, it's like saying sick him to a bulldog when a pastor has a congregation that wants to hear the Word of God. And we stand on the authority of Scriptures. And uh, that's what Paul is writing in the book of Galatians. If you wonder why we're having a Bible study this morning, there's two reasons why we're having a Bible study. Primarily because we're starting the book of Galatians, and I hope this morning to spark your interest. If you hear what we do in these Bible studies, and by the way, the Bible studies just go verse by verse. We start chapter 1, verse 1, go all the way through a book. And since we're still on verse 1, I thought it would be good to have a Bible study this morning. Because uh, you may want to get in on this, and that way you may want to come back on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. The second reason I want to have a Bible study is because lately the Lord has really put on my heart so many things that I would like to teach. The church is really growing, and there's so many things that I feel that the church needs to know about the Word of God, you, things you need to know in the Scriptures. And so I don't know, and I'm not going to say that I'm going to do this, but for a while we may have Bible study on Sunday morning so that we can go right on through some of these things so I can get into teaching other things. It's either that or we can uh, uh, have two midweek worship services. So <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do yet. But turn, if you will, to the book of Galatians. And uh, we are on verse 1 of the book of Galatians, chapter 1. And as I said, I hope to finish this verse this morning. I certainly hope that you come back tonight because we're going to find out tonight what is grace and you're going to find out that if you don't have grace, you don't have peace. And there's a lot of Christians in the world today, a lot of people in the world that just don't have peace. A lot of people today are just scared to death to die and it shouldn't be that way. And the other night I was talking to my aunt in the hospital. She had a knee removed and she's 77 years old. And I was talking to her, and I said, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Christians are, are afraid to die. You find this out when you're a pastor, and you go to the hospitals, and you talk to a lot of people that supposedly are Christians, but they just don't have that peace. And she said, well, why not? She said, I don't understand why anybody that's saved fears death. And that's the way it should be. And tonight we're going to discover how you can have peace. And we find that peace only comes by grace. It's the grace of God. If you understand the grace of God, then you will have the peace of God that passeth understanding. And we all need this peace because of the trials that's coming upon the Word. I'm going to read verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. The apostle Paul wants it very clearly understood that he is an apostle. And the Apostle Paul, all of his ministry had to defend his apostleship. I, I was noticing in the scriptures, I turned to Romans. Now, you can mark these down, but don't take the time to 
turn to them because I'll be moving very quickly. But in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul gives a salutation, then says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. In other words, the Apostle Paul has something here to be thankful for. And then we find then in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes after the salutation, he has something to be thankful for. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then we will turn to the book, or I will turn to the book of Thessalonians. And we find here that Paul is giving thanks, and once again, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And then he writes to the Philippians, And once again I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel and from the first day and unto now. But it's amazing in the book of Galatians and the... Well, Paul, as he writes the epistles, he always finds something that he can be thankful for. But we find in the book of Galatians, he gives the salutation and then he jumps right on the subject because he cannot find anything that he can give thanks for concerning the Galatians. And as I brought out previously, the Galatians was a Gentile church there in the province of Galatia and he had wrote to these churches there in Galatia. And Galatia was... Uh, primarily the Gauls that had come in there through southeast Europe and settled in that part of the country. And they were a very intelligent people. They were a tall people. They were excellent warriors. But they were a very foolish people or a fickle people. They were always changing. Now, when Paul writes to the Galatians, we find in there... Uh, in his voice as he writes that, a little bit of frustration, a little bit of anger, but also a whole lot of urgency. He's very urgent when he writes the epistle to the Galatians. He's very disturbed and he finds nothing to thank them for. And the reason for that is is because the Galatians... Uh, had received false prophets from Jerusalem and they had come in there and perverted the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and these foolish Galatians had swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Now, in the third chapter, he calls them foolish Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians. I looked that up in the Greek word study books and that means unreflecting Galatians. In other words, you came to church and leave your brains at home. Now, that's exactly what he's saying. One of the other commentaries interpreted it like this. He said, Oh, dear idiots. You're people that don't think. The Apostle Paul had come through there and he had preached that man is saved by grace through faith, and soon as he had left, then the false prophets, the Judaizers, came right on his heels. And that's the way it was all during Paul's ministry. They were like the, the frogs of Egypt that just followed Paul around. And he says, you're foolish. You received the grace of God. You were saved. And soon as I leave, here come the false prophets that come in there with a gospel which is not a gospel. He said, you people leave your brains at home. Listen, I want to tell you something. When you come to church, bring your brains with you, will you? And bring your Bible with you, will you? Because the Bible teaches that you're not supposed to listen to just anybody that gets up in the pulpit and claims to be speaking for God. You are to check it out. And I ask you, when I get in the pulpit to preach, open your Bible and check it out. Because you don't know, and that's the only way you're going to know, if I'm a false prophet or not. Paul said that the Berean church were, no, uh, were more noble than the uh, Thessalonians because, he said, they received the gospel readily, but they checked the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. In other words, the apostle Paul came in there and preached to them, but they also having only the Old Testament, checked in the Old Testament to be sure that what Paul was teaching them was correct and was true. 
And you're supposed to do that. But it's amazing. We live in a day when people will just follow anybody. Anybody that stands up and has a following, we claim they're God's man, and whatever he says, we just accept that. It's terrible. It shouldn't be that way. And the apostle Paul is trying to say here, I am an apostle and I speak for God, and these men are false apostles that brought in this gospel, which is not another gospel. Now, why do you suppose he said it's a gospel which is not another gospel? I'll tell you why he said that. Because false doctrine can look so much like the real thing. People don't realize that. Listen, when Satan changes something, when he changes the gospel, he changes it just a little bit, just enough so that you will buy it. That's all he has to do, and it ruins it. You see, there's only one way that you can be saved, and that's by grace through faith plus nothing else. If you add anything to it that ruins it, you have no salvation. Now, here's what the false teachers were doing. They were coming in there, and they were adding good works on the front end of the gospel and good works on the back end of the gospel, which makes it not a gospel at all. You see, they were coming in there saying, now, to be saved, you must be circumcised. Now, once you're circumcised, then they would preach to them the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How that he went to the cross, he died for their sins, they buried him, he rose again the third day. So they were put tacking works on the front of it, and then they were preaching Christ, and then they were tacking works on the back of it, saying, now that you're saved, you have to keep the laws of Moses or you won't stay saved. Does that sound familiar? A lot of people are saying the same thing. The same thing. If we don't baptize you, you can't be saved. A lot of churches are teaching, you've got to be baptized to be saved. That's exactly what the false prophets were saying. Only they were substituting circumcision for that. You've got to be baptized to be saved. Then once you are saved, then you've got to keep yourself saved by the good works that you perform. That's exactly what they were saved. And Paul was very distraught and very alarmed by what these false prophets were teaching. Now, first of all, Paul wants you to know something about the false prophet. He said, they are not here. They did not come all this way because they loved you. You say, Jerry, where did you get that? Well, turn to the sixth chapter of Galatians. And Paul gives the reason why they're there. The 6th chapter, 11th verse. <clears throat> you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand? He said, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, he says, they're there for their own glory. They make a fair show in the flesh. Now, these were legalistic evangelists. I mean very zealous. And as soon as Paul would leave an area, boy, they would come in there just a ripping and a snorting. And I mean they'd have a big old time revival. And they'd bring in their false doctrine. Now, why were they doing that? They weren't doing that because they give a flip about the, about the Galatians. But so they could go back to, to Jerusalem and brag about the big meetings they'd had and how many converts they had made. You see, they were doing nothing but glorifying the flesh. We hear a lot of that today. The big meetings. You can turn on the TV and watch some of these religious programs. And a, a, a lot of the preachers on there, they're always bragging about where they've been and the big meetings they've had and how many miracles they've had and all this sort of thing. They were only glorifying the flesh. But it says they circumcised them so they would not suffer persecution. Why is that? Because, you see, a Jew had a lot of opposition. If he would just accept Jesus Christ by faith plus nothing, the rest of the Jews would really persecute him. Peter found that out. Peter found that out when he went to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, and Cornelius was saved and, and uh, he was baptized. When he came back, I mean the Jews, jumped right in the big middle of Peter and he had to apologize. He said, hey, wait a minute, guys. It wasn't my fault. He said, I saw this vision. The sheep come down from heaven and it's filled with all manner of animals and God said, kill and eat. And he said, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything that was unclean. And this, he saw this vision three times and, 
And God said, don't call unclean what I've cleansed. So anyway, he went to the house of Cornelius, and boy, that was a humbling experience, because I'll tell you what, Jews wouldn't have anything to do with Gentiles. I mean, they were barbarians, they were unclean, they didn't want anything to do with it. But he comes into the house of Cornelius, he preaches the gospel, Cornelius is saved, but then when he gets back, these Jews jump all over him, and he said, hey guys, I couldn't help it. He said, that's what God told me to do, and I went to do it. And he said, what else could I do? See, he was even intimidated. But these people are intimidated. They go out and they preach their false doctrine, and they come back, but they put the people under law so that the Jews won't put them under persecution and intimidation. But the Apostle Paul says, do I please God or do I please men? He said, if I'm a servant of Christ, I'm no longer, or if I'm a servant of men, I'm no longer a servant of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful that the Apostle Paul would stand up on his hind legs and preach the pure truth, the grace of God. And he said, I want you to know that I am an apostle. Now, in the book of 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul did the same thing as he did earlier. He had something to be thankful for. He says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. He said, I'm thankful for you people there at Corinth. Now, that's amazing under the, light of, uh, under the circumstances. You see, the Corinthian church was in a mess. I mean, everything, how many has heard of Murphy's Law? If it can go wrong, it will. You know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. I'll tell you, the Corinthian church was completely out of order completely. But yet he said, I'm still thankful for them. The Corinthian church was having all kinds of problems. One thing they was doing was bragging on preachers. They said, boy, Paul, he's the best. The other said, oh, no, uh, Peter, he's the best. Another one said, Apollos is the best. And he said, it doesn't make any difference. We're all preaching the same gospel. Then they were suing one another. Christians were suing one another. They were also, they weren't discerning the Lord's body. In other words, they didn't know how to take the Lord's Supper. Everything in the world. Now notice this. Paul said that they had every spiritual gift that there was. Every spiritual gift that there was. But did you think he did not say they were spiritual he said, you're carnal. You're carnal. Listen, spiritual gifts do not make you spiritual. Now, a lot of people today will teach you that. they say, hey, boy, if you don't talk in tongues, you're not spiritual. That has nothing to do with spirituality. They had every gift, every gift, the Holy Spirit gifts, but they were anything but spiritual. He said, you're carnal, you're just like babies. What were they doing? What were they doing? One time I went to see a circus. First time I'd ever seen a circus. Wrangling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. And I'd always heard of a three-ring circus. Has anybody ever seen a three-ring circus? Well, I did. I'd never seen one. And they have three rings out there, and they have performers going on all the time in these three different rings. And I didn't like it because I'd try to watch this juggler, and I'd try to watch this guy, and there's another guy doing this, and I couldn't keep my mind on You know, I was just going back and forth. I thought, man, just do it one at a time so I can catch it all, so I can get it all in. But they had three things going on at the same time. Now, in the Corinthian church, I'll tell you that was total confusion. I'll tell you what they was doing. Half of them were standing there speaking in unknown tongues. You had some guys over here singing solos. You had this guy over here trying to teach a Sunday school class. It was all going on at the same time. Paul said, people come in here, they're going to think you're mad. You're crazy. So the church was totally in upheaval. It was a mess. And the apostle Paul wrote to that church, to straighten all of that out. It was really a mess. But he said, I'm still thankful for that church. He said, I find something I can be thankful for. Now, the, what he was thankful for was they did receive the gospel and they adhered to the gospel. But in Galatians, he said, I don't find anything that I'm thankful for. You have a very dangerous situation. It's very dangerous because, listen, it doesn't make any difference what I teach this lady right here. If soon as I'm gone, somebody comes in and tells her something different, she just buys it. She needs to check her Bible to see if I'm telling her what's correct. And if someone else starts preaching to her, she needs to check her Bible to see if what they tell her is correct. Now, the Apostle Paul wants it very clear right off the bat that he is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible gives at least six things that set the criteria for apostle. Now, I covered some of these 
Wednesday night, I want to go back over them very quickly. The first one is this. The, the Bible says in Ephesians that God gave to the church first apostles, then prophets, then evangelists, then pastors, then teachers. All right? He gave to the church apostles and prophets one time. Not continuous down through time. Now, a lot of people today claim to have apostles in their church. I met an apostle one time. My cousin brought him over to the house. He was of a cult. <laughs> and uh, he wanted me to meet this apostle for the purpose of changing my belief. That man definitely was not an apostle. He didn't meet any of the qualifications for apostle. Not only that, he didn't even have his doctrine straight. God gave to the church apostles one time. There was 12 apostles, one fell, God replaced that one. The Bible says in Ephesians that the church is built upon the, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. As I brought out Wednesday night, when you build a building, you lay a foundation one time. Is that correct? Then you begin to build stories on top of that, and when you get to the 15th story, you don't lay another foundation. The church is built upon the doctrines, the teachings of Jesus Christ and those apostles. So the, there's only room for the original apostles that came through and laid the foundation for the church. We don't need apostles in this day and age. The church has already been founded on a solid rock, on the solid rock, on the doctrine of the apostles and the prophets. The second thing is that an apostle had to be handpicked of the Lord. Handpicked of the Lord. In Matthew, it says that Jesus went up into a mountain. He prayed when he come down out of the mountain. The Bible says that he called his disciples together. We don't know how many there was. There might have been 200, 300. We don't know. It doesn't say. But out of those, he chose 12 men and called them apostles. And the word apostle means special ambassador or proxy. Proxy. That man has the power of attorney. Whatever an apostle spoke was same as Jesus speaking it. So they had to be handpicked. Thirdly, there was what's called the signs of the apostle. You see, God three times in history gave signs. He gave signs to accredit the message and also the messenger. Moses worked miracles because God was giving new revelation through Moses. After Moses, then God worked miracles through Elijah and Elisha because the office of, of the prophet or the revival of the prophets was being established. So they worked miracles to accredit the message and also the messenger. Now, all down through time, they've had lots of prophets, great prophets. Jesus said, John the Baptist, he said, there's not a woman, woman born a man greater than John the Baptist. He was one of the, one of the greatest prophets there was, but he worked no miracles. Okay, then in Jesus and the apostles' days, they worked miracles to accredit the message and also to accredit the messenger. You see, people have the idea that Back in the days of the apostles, back in the early church, everybody was running around working miracles. That's not true. The apostles were working the miracles. Now, it was to accredit the message. In other words, stop and think about it. If, everybody, if all the believers were running around working miracles, you wouldn't know who to believe. You wouldn't know if they had the message straight or not. But the apostles were working the miracles and also there might have been a few others that were working miracles that were appointed by the apostles. We know that Stephen works some miracles. But they weren't miracles like, you, like we hear of today. I still believe that God works some miracles. I believe he does. I believe he heals people. But what I'm talking about are sign miracles, sign gifts, where there's no misunderstanding, there's no doubt in your mind that it is a miracle. When Moses parted the Red Sea, friend, you knew that was a miracle, Right? When Jesus raised a man from the dead that had been dead four days, you knew that was a miracle. I mean, there was no misunderstanding about it. That was a miracle. The Bible says that Peter and John went into the temple and there was a man sitting there that had been born lame and they healed him. 
in Jesus' name. And even the priest said, now a great and notable miracle has been done today and we can't deny it. We can't deny it. That's what a sign miracle is. Something there, there's no doubt in your mind. All right, the apostles worked miracles. Another thing, one of the, one of the criteria for an apostle is he had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. He had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. Every one of the apostles had to have seen Christ after he was raised from the dead. The apostle Paul saw the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus when he was converted. So that's one of the other signs. Now I want to get down to the two concluding signs. And one of them is that the apostles had what was called apostolic authority. I mean to tell you, when they spoke, it was just like God himself speaking. Turn, if you will, to Corinthians. I'm kind of hurrying this as much as I can because I told you I would finish this verse, and I intend to finish this verse. The 14th chapter of Corinthians, 29th verse. 1 Corinthians, 14th chapter. 29th verse. Now here's what the Apostle Paul is saying about the prophets. Now let me tell you about the prophets. As the scripture was being written, there were also prophets in the church, and the prophets did two things. They would preach on or tell about scripture that had already been written, the letters that has already circulating, but they would also give new revelation. They would give new revelation. So here's how Paul said you can tell if the revelation is of God. They also had what was called the gift of discernment. Some had this gift of discernment. Now notice something, verse 29, Paul setting out the order for the churches because it was in complete chaos. He said, let the prophets speak two or three. In other words, either two or three of them speak. No more than that, not 15 sermons. Either two or three and let the others judge. In other words, when a prophet would get up to speak, the others that were spiritual would judge to see if what he was saying fit and jived with other scripture. And notice something. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. In other words, one might be getting up and he might be preaching from one of the letters they already had. There might be another prophet here that just got a new revelation. He would stand up, the other one would hold his peace, and this one would give the new revelation. But when he would give the new revelation, the other prophets would listen to be sure if that indeed was from God. Now notice something else. For you may all prophesy by, one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now, what do you suppose he put that in there? Because during that day, there was a lot of paganism, and they also had prophets. But these prophets would stand up, and like being in a trance, they'd just kind of, their eyes would roll back, and they'd begin to speak all this prophecy. And he says, that's not the way it is. He said, the prophets are subject to the spirits of the prophets. Now, let me give you an illustration. God called me to preach, and I love to preach but I don't have to preach. I can't say, Sunday morning I've got to preach. That's what God told me to do. And so everybody sit down, shut up. I'm going to preach because that's what I've got to do. I don't have to do that. If I have the opportunity, I preach what God has put on my heart. But I'm, my prophecy or my ministry, my preaching is subject to me. I don't have to do it. Let me give you an illustration. Sometimes we have testimony meetings and some of you really feel like you need to give a testimony, but you won't do it. You don't just have to jump up and do it. And that's what Paul, he said, if, if it's of God, if it's of God, you can control it. See, if you couldn't control it, then he couldn't say if someone's given a Bible lesson and someone else has something to add, let this one hold his peace. And they weren't doing that. People were just all talking at the same time and it was confusion. But now I want to show you what Paul said in the 37th verse. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. In other words, when a prophet got up to speak, they judged it. But when an apostle stood up to speak, they didn't judge that. That was the word of the Lord, and they knew it was the word of the Lord. And he said, so if some of you people think you're spiritual, if some of you people think that you're prophet, 
He says, here's how the church can know if they respect what I have commanded them. If they confess or adhere to the fact that that they will come under apostolic authority, then let them speak. If they don't, don't hear them. Because notice what he says. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In other words, if he is ignorant of the fact that I'm an apostle and I speak the words of the Lord, then just let him be ignorant. Let him remain ignorant. Don't listen to him. But God will judge him. That's what he's saying. The apostles, when they spoke, they were speaking scripture. The reason Paul spent so much time defending his apostleship is because he knew how important that was. He knew that what he was speaking was the very commandments of God, the very word of God. And he knew that it was scripture. And it really troubled him that these false prophets would come in and pervert the true gospel. And he wanted the Galatians to know, I'm I'm an apostle. What I speak comes directly from God. You better listen to what I'm saying. That's what he's saying. And I want to tell you something. It's time the church gets back to scriptural authority. This is the word of God, and we better listen to what it says and not so-called prophets that's being raised up during this day. We know these were apostles, and what they spoke was the word of the Lord. We don't know what these other guys are doing that's jumping up and claiming to be prophets. Assembly of God preacher said this. He said, when someone stands up in my church and prophesies, he said, I know one of two things. Either it's of the Lord or it's not of the Lord. He said, that's all we know. And he said, we better cut it out and we better get back to the word of God because we know this is God's word. Now stop and think about this a minute. If I jump up here before you say, Thus saith the Lord, and I give you a prophecy, if that indeed is of the Lord, then that's just as valid as Scripture, right? Listen, the Bible's already complete. We've got everything that we need to know right here. We don't need more revelation. We don't need more prophecy. Not only that, The church was built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. They had prophets during that day because the scriptures weren't complete. Now they are. It's all summed up. Revelation says, then. And if any man adds to or takes away, then the plagues of this book shall be added unto him. Be careful. It better be, thus saith the Lord. And if it's thus saith the Lord, it comes right out of here. Listen, everything I need to know in this life I can find right here. I don't need somebody to get up and tell me a bunch of junk that they think the Lord said. And did you ever notice when they do, it's way out. It's using something way out and it don't come to pass anyway. Listen. Listen to the Scriptures. Listen to the Scriptures. And the Apostle Paul says this, you are saved by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. Now, if you get saved, we'll want to baptize you. But that doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. And don't let anybody tell you that it does. I want to tell you something else. When God saves you, God keeps you. You don't keep yourself by your works. That's the gospel according to Paul. Now, there's one other criteria. The apostles have a unique place in eternity. The Bible says in the pearly white city that the names of the 12 apostles are written in the 12 foundations. Now, where are all these other apostles that's jumping up today? Where are they going to fit in? I'll guarantee you, there's only going to be 12 names in that foundation. And they're going to be the apostles of the Lord. Something else I happen to think, Matthew wrote one book Mark wrote one book. Luke wrote two books. John wrote five books. Jude wrote one book. Peter wrote two books in the New Testament. Paul wrote 14 books, maybe 15 if you credit Hebrews to him. The Bible says that the church was built upon the foundation of the apostles. 
I'll guarantee you, when we see the pearly white city, his name will be one of them that's in that foundation. He's an apostle. You better listen to what the prophets and the apostles wrote and the Holy Spirit declares is Scripture. Because listen, you're trusting your soul to them. Now, I want to finish with this because my time is out. I'm going to finish up verse 1. The apostles have a very unique place in eternity. Their names will be written in the 12 foundations. But did you know what? If you're saved, you also have a very unique place. The Bible says that God is building a spiritual house. That's what Paul said. And this house is being built upon that foundation laid by the apostles. Peter says you are living stones that go into this structure. Now, here's what thrills me. I'm going somewhere in that wall. There's a hole in that wall, and only I can fill it. There's a place in that building that only you can fill. I have a unique place in eternity. And if you're saved, you have a unique place in eternity. You won't be the foundation that's reserved for the apostle. But in God's spiritual house, you will have a unique place. Now you say, man, I don't know. What kind of a house is this going to be? As many faults that I have, I mean, I just can't imagine what that's going to look like because I look at everybody in church and they got as many problems as I do and they got as many faults as I do and I don't know what this is going to look like. I want to read you something that the Lord's brother wrote. Jude, this really blesses me. 24th verse says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Who keeps you from falling? Jesus, not your works. He said he is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless to God that will place you in this spiritual house that will endure through eternity. Paul was an apostle. He defended the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he defends it, I'm going to defend it because the Bible says, ten for the faith once delivered unto the saints. We better stick with the scriptures. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful that this morning we could... Uh, Come together and study thy word. And we're so thankful for all of those apostles that were true to you and, and that contended for the word and all of those apostles that suffered for your namesake to be sure that that foundation was indeed laid and that it was laid correctly. Now, Father, we just pray that we take the scriptures and believe the scriptures and apply the scriptures to our life. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that don't know you as their Savior, Father, help them to realize that they are saved strictly because of your love and because of your mercy and because you will forgive them. Help them to realize that. Father, lead us and guide us by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.